I'm Kathy Hansen, uh, president of Mojave Transportation Museum. And no, we don't have a building. The whole airport is a museum because there's so much history here. I am going to introduce our, our friend, Diane J. Barney Jr. is a local private pilot and engineer currently working at, uh, on the NASA Armstrong X-57. Of course, that's to pay for her flying with the Grumman Tiger and the J-3 and the Boeing Stearman. <laughs> and uh, <laughs> originally from Albany, New York, <laughs> she caught the aerospace bug when she was only 12. Come on in. There's chairs. And, and just move those name tags and scoot over to make room. Yeah. Scoot out over. That's good. You can sit in the big coochie <laughs> Oh, gosh. <laughs> yeah. <coughs> Diane was uh, 12. She got her first flight and a Normanka champ. And that, that did it for her. She earned her um, Bachelor of Science uh, degree in aeronautical and astronautical engineering from Purdue <coughs> University in uh, 2009 and received her commission from the um, Boilermaker AF ROTC Detachment 220 the same year. So during her six years in active duty, uh, she worked uh, in operational flight test on B1B, uh, RQ4, and U2s. So pretty hmm. cool. She told me the story about flying in the B1. She got to swing the wings. Anyway. <laughs> and kicking the burners. Uh -huh. <laughs> kicking the burners, yes! <laughs> anyway, since arriving in the Elk Valley in 2015, she's worked at Scale Composites, uh, the spaceship company, now Virgin Galactic, um, Empirical Systems Aerospace, and now is contractor for uh, NASA with the X-57 Maxwell. And that's the all-electric airplane. Mm. Uh, Diane is one of five members of the Mojave Air and Space Board Board of Directors. She sits up here during meetings. Um, I guess it's been on Zoom, hasn't it? Oh, no, that, that's my chair right there. Oh, that's your chair. <laughs> okay. That used to be my chair. Anyway, uh, <laughs> and um, she had an action-packed uh, trip to the EAA Air Venture in Oshkosh, and then on to New York, on up into Maryland and then uh, home again. So uh, please welcome our intrepid friend, <laughs> Diane Garland. So I'm thoroughly delighted that I got the invitation to come speak to you this morning. I had just a wonderful time. Um, there's a handful of stories I really want to tell you, but there's an all, nearly infinite number of anecdotes that I can drive down into and easily get distracted by. So thank you so much for coming here, and I hope you find this uh, entertaining. So this uh, this photo I, I did take actually. Oh, oh no, I'm sorry. And some strobes. Yeah, I thought I'd add a little strobe light. Uh, there, there's a place there where it just <coughs> doesn't like. Oh, I think that's good. Thank you, Gabby. Sure. Then I actually took that from the Bell 47 at Oshkosh this year. So this trip, um, I'm so glad I did wind up being able to do uh, half of Oshkosh. The primary reason I went on this trip, though, is I hadn't seen my parents uh, since the COVID shutdowns. And they're all the way in Albany, New York, where I grew up. Uh, they still live out there. They're retired. And so that was really my primary motivation for grabbing the tiger and hauling on out there. I've flown to New York before, but I haven't done it in my airplane. So I was really excited um, to take my Grumman Tiger. Yeah, come on in. Have a seat. Uh, my Grumman Tiger is a 1978 180 horsepower. It's not fancy, so this is a picture of the panel I took just after I got back. But you'll notice there's no moving map GPS, there's no GPS in it whatsoever, so I had this hmm. with fourth flight on it, and an iPad that doesn't have GPS but it's got all the charts loaded on it, so, you know, VFR charts. Uh, it's not IFR rated, neither am I, so I'm at the whim of, uh, of weather. Uh, clouds and wind. Uh, it's, uh, it, it's been a really great flyer. I've owned it for nine years, so I, I know it pretty well at this point. I had 650 hours in this airplane uh, prior, prior to heading out. But it's a little four-seater, thousand pound useful load. So with that thousand pound useful load, I wasn't too concerned about how much junk I was just throwing in the back. So I was planning on living out of it for a couple of weeks, figured this would be about a, a two-week adventure, and packed accordingly. 
Uh, so I brought um, a number of tools with me, enough to do basic field maintenance. If I got trapped somewhere where there was no civilization, no people, I could at least get the plane out and get to somewhere with a proper maintenance on field. Um, so I, I wanted the ability to do some basic electrical work, be able to pull the cowl if I absolutely had to, uh, safety wire, tons of uses, like if a cotter pin goes, something like that. Uh, so that's, that's what I, that and some basic electrical work. So a socket wrench set so I can pull, uh, pull the batteries and a multimeter to do some troubleshooting. So that, that was my mindset going into this. I brought a PLB, personal locator beacon. So can we have three chairs? It's okay. Okay, we even got comfy ones. It's all right. All right. Um, so brought a PLB because um, I don't like just following highways. I want to go see like this incredible country. There's so much terrain to see. It's, it's spectacular. So I didn't want to be uh, too concerned about, um, all right, if I do have to land out, I would like the ability to um, be found. So PLB, highly recommend that registered with NOAA if you're going to be doing any flying away from civilization. Spare oil. Life vests. I was really hoping to get to see the Great Lakes, so life vests just in case. Distilled water to clean the canopy of the aircraft, which I didn't use at all. It still has all the bugs on it. <laughs> camping gear. <coughs> I was planning on camping at Oshkosh, and um, I really like the option of being able to camp at airports so I can get to the plane quicker and get going in the morning. I uh, just like having the option. So electronics, so like I said, the iPad with the charts, you know, chargers for the phone, that kind of thing. Laptop. My work laptop, just in case I get stuck, I continue to remote work and don't have to take too much vacation. Uh, clothes, toiletries, all the usual suspects there. I had about a week's worth of food in the plane, mostly shelf stable, um, so it's just to save a little bit of money and so that I didn't have to spend time trying to find a restaurant. So, um, and then uh, 36 bottles of water as well as my refillable water bottles. This is big stretches of desert, can't have too much water. And then a printout of the Oshkosh Yoda. So we talked about the tools that I brought, but I wanted to make sure the aircraft was in good shape for the trip. So there are a few things on my radar. In general, it's a mechanically good airplane. There's been some electrical gremlins, hence the focus on bringing tools to do some electrical work. I see people who have helped me with my electrical gremlins uh, grinning in the crowd. <laughs> uh, but uh, I was planning this about a month out, and three weeks before the trip, I'm picking up a friend out of Placerville who's dropping off an aircraft and my crankshaft seal blew in flight. So that's a story in and of itself, but you can see my oil covered canopy. So as it was, it was building as I'm trying to get to a runway. Um, didn't lose pressure fortunately, it wasn't nearly as dramatic as how I can make it sound. Fortunately it wasn't, it wasn't too bad. You can see all the oil streaking out of the prop seal to the point where it looks like I have oil coming out of my landing light. Uh, did make it to Columbia. I have an IA friend there, so you know it's great. You know I have somebody to help me. But it's still going to take a week. We still got to wait on parts. He's still got to work it into his schedule. So even though he was able to prioritize it real quick, okay, that's one less week of maintenance that I have. And there wasn't anything I needed to have done, but the aircraft doesn't have ADSB. And if you're not familiar with ADSB, you don't really need it to fly around VFR but it makes it hard to go above 10,000 feet. It makes it hard to go into class Charlie airspace. It makes it hard to fly over class Bravo. You have to do paperwork ahead of time for each of those if you don't have ADSB. And then the FAA needs to approve it and it needs to be done so far in advance. And I'd been using that system called ADAPT and it was getting rejected about 50% of the time and I didn't know why. Now Albany International, which is where I really want to go, is a class Charlie and it would be nice to be able to fly directly in there without being at the whim of FAA paperwork. So, all right, I've owned ADSB for two years, but it's been in a box in the back of the year and I just haven't done anything with it. So it's time, we're doing it before this trip. But in order to install the box in the antenna, I'm not a fan of drilling into airframes because this aircraft is probably going to live longer than I am. Really, with personal aircraft, we're just their caretakers for a short period of time. And if I drill into it every time I want to install, I don't want it to be Swiss cheese in 50 years for whoever has it at that point. So I'm pretty resistant. <laughs> Plus, I had inspiration from another Grumman Tiger owner and how he installed his antenna, and I really like that setup. Um, so, uh, to avoid drilling into the glare shield, so it's this piece right here, so you've got your if I'm the pilot sitting here, I've got my instrument panel. It's what lays on top of that and really just keeps debris out and you know, sometimes operates as a shelf if you need it for your charts. Um, that's the GPS antenna as installed. You can see these four little screws 
for the ADS-B box itself, the GDL82. This is the underside right here. Um, so I wanted to fabricate my own glare shield, uh, did it out of composites because it was easy to work with. Um, I used a conductive paint um, rather than a ground plane, so that's why it looks like it's just rattle cam, because it is rattle cam, but it's rattle cam with something that contains nickel for, uh, for a ground plane. I never used that before, that was really neat. Um, used some self-extinguishing speaker cover <coughs> fabric to cover it, used, uh, used actually the Loctite brand spray adhesive, and um, so this was a bit of a to-do, and remember I really only had about a week and a half at this point because of the crankshaft seal maintenance. So we got it finished up 11 p.m. before the day I was set to depart. Wow. I really wanted to set out, you know, Friday <coughs> afternoon after work, but this needed, I decided I was getting this done, and so we knocked it out, and I was able to go on Saturday. So thank you to being a mechanic who was there installing it with me and getting it done and making sure it worked before I went. So yes, thank you to Doug and Rick and Phil, getting my plane in good enough shape to break down on the first day. <laughs> <laughs> so this is the plan. And you notice I don't have all the fuel stops in here, because really when you're doing a cross country, especially VFR only and in a little airplane, again, you're really subject to weather, it don't go too neurotic trying to nail down every little detail, because it's not gonna happen. So here was my general plan, right? Okay, so ultimate goal, get out here to New York hopefully visit a really dear college friend of mine and his wife out in Maryland. Um, on the way, okay, let's pick a couple of cool things to do prior to Oshkosh. I really wanted to get Telluride in my logbook because I haven't done it yet. It's the highest altitude uh, public use airport that would have just been really neat. Um, and I wanted to go tour the Great Lakes. Because I've seen them from the ground. I had family in Michigan we used to drive by it, but I've never seen the Great Lakes from the air. Come in, come in, have a seat. Comfy chair or uncomfy chair? You're fit. Follow, follow me. <laughs> Excuse me. No problem. <coughs> so I really wanted to go see the Great Lakes from the air. I thought that would be really spectacular. But they really are great. They are great. But, no, go ahead. As we just talked about, though, with trying to plan a general aviation flight, th this went exactly 0% how I wanted, especially the front half of it. I get up to my first fuel stop, establish my starter is going to break on me and then it broke the next morning up in Casper. So I wound up doing a fantastic tour of the country, two radically different ways, going there and coming back, so I got to see all new terrain, and that was really fun. But it's not what I planned on. I have the numbers. 29 flights over the course of 19 days, over 5,800 nautical miles covered, uh, over 50 hours logged in the Tiger, only one maintenance issue on the Tiger. There was another maintenance issue on another airplane, we'll get to that. Uh, two new weather phenomenon I've never heard about before and got to fly through. That was great. Uh, 16 friends and family visited a whole new bunch of friends. Aw, this is going to be a touching story about community, isn't it? <laughs> Not just airplanes. Aw. <laughs> so don't worry about that eye chart. That's really just if, if you have questions about like the individual flights, we can come back and reference. So that's effectively what's in my logbook, what days I was where, what airports, and how long each flight was. The longest flight, four and a half hours, it's the longest continuous flight I've ever done in the Tiger. It was the very last one. I was able to go Albuquerque to, uh, to Mojave in one shot. I couldn't believe it. I had a tailwind going east to west. Wow. That was awesome. That's hmm. great. Yeah. Yeah, so the Tiger cruises 135 knots, and it has a five hour endurance if you include the reserve, about four. So usually I plan for three, three and a half hours. Right. So the first flight, we already talked about how this, uh, this kind of turned out. Um, you know, it's, it's kind of a footnote in the story, but the terrain you fly over is mind-blowing. It's just spectacular. Like, this desert is, is absolutely gorgeous. Mm -hmm. So I wound up um, going around the restricted, south of Vegas, swinging north. I was able to see the western rim of the Grand Canyon from the distance. There are a lot of storms, so it was kind of hard to pick out. It's so beautiful. And it ended up at Canop. So just over the border in Utah. It's in Utah by about a mile. Wow. <laughs> Here's some photos of just what it looked like. So, um, kind of a cloudy, rainy day. Um, not real strong storms, but you know, some some rain showers. Uh, Lake Powell. Um, that's kind of what it looked like closer to Canada, getting dark. So this is still middle of the day. This isn't dusk. So there were some pretty good storms. Um, flying over the desert. That's the Grand Canyon right there. That's just the opening of it. And then there's Canada. Who knows what this is? <laughs> Just, uh, <laughs> 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 Bonus points to Rick. Um, 
thanks to the ones of you who said broken starter. <laughs> it's a little revealing that I have a photo of it not installed in the airplane. Interesting. Uh, <clears throat> How'd that happen? So right, the starter, it's a device that bolts on, on the Tiger. It's on the underside of the engine on the left side of the aircraft. This little spur gear, when you hit your little start button, it pops out and engages with the ring gear that's connected to the crankshaft and the prop, and so it's what makes everything in your motor turn and tells sparks ignite fuel, and you're up and running, and then it disengages. That's what it should do. However. So, <laughs> however, <laughs> however, so I get to the can of, all right, you know, fill the plane with fuel, eat a quick sandwich, all right, cool, good to go. All right, so, you know, I do my pre-flight, you know, get everything set up, I go to hit my starter, I hear one thunk. Oh, no. Oh. The initial thunk is the solenoid. Then you should hear a second thunk of it at least trying to engage, and we didn't have a second thunk. One thunk, not good. Need two thunks. Ideally, prop spinning. Uh, so I fiddled with that for a few minutes, and eventually I got it rolling. Like, okay, I need to plan on this braking. So even though I preferred to land kind of middle of nowhere, just camp, stay out of everybody's hair, get going quickly, like, no. Nah, I need to stop somewhere with maintenance, somewhere with civilization. Right. So that's why I made a plan to go to Casper. Again, mind-blowingly beautiful countryside, uh, just the desert was so cool, um, but I started to run into really thick smoke in addition to the storms. Um, so I decided to go north to Casper because there were a, a line of uh, storms here, so I'm like, right, I can either go south around the Rockies or north around the Rockies, we're not crossing the Rockies. Um, but yeah, so just a beautiful desert, I'm like, all right, we'll make it up to Casper, that's a significant city, I checked, they did have maintenance on the field, so if a problem were to arise, we can address it. So this screenshot here, so this is for flight. So this is effectively what I have going on my phone um, as, as my primary navigation. I've got my backup navigation. This is what I have primarily. So you can see all these little, these little lightning bolts are uh, lightning strikes that have happened within the past few minutes. So all right, we're going to line over the Rockies. A little bit of fuzz here. Flying through green is fine. It's not preferred. It's just kind of a light rain. So it's not a showstopper, but eh, I'd rather stay out of it because I don't really know what's going to build. Um, I don't have ADS beat in. I don't have XM satellite weather, so I can't rely on real-time real weather uh, in flight. So it, it's just, all right, when I'm lucky enough to have service, I get it great, but really on the ground is when I need to make my plan and then just keep an eye out around me. I'm also doing flight following uh, so that they can warn me if there's any significant storms, but I'm VFR, I'm not the priority, so I can't fully rely on them. They were very helpful. And so these are just some shots of what I flew over. So the, the Vermilion Ridge here is right out of Canib. Um, you can see the smoke here. One thing I wanted to do on this route is the Green River Canyon is spectacular. I've flown across it before, but not through it, and I really wanted to go through it, but terrain is 10,000 foot each side, and all I can see is this. I'm not getting down in it. I can't see to avoid the rocks. So, all right, we're just going to go over it then. Uh, just a beautiful terrain. And then I couldn't even get the camera to focus. That's how smoky it was. That's Casper Airport right there. Uh -huh. So I'm only about three or four miles out at that point. It's still like, oh, where is it? Yeah, it's in there. And then, yeah, all the smoke made for a beautiful, like, bright red sunset. So I go to start at Casper in the morning. I knew something was going to happen, right? So I just tie down overnight. I only get a hotel for one night. But I go to start the plane. <coughs> um, there's a line guy out there because they have commercial service. So, you know, you have your line guy as your escort to help you and pull your chocks. And you feel very important, even, <laughs> even though you're in your little bitty airplane. Um, but he's there watching me try to start, and before I hit the button, say, hey, pray for my starter. Mm -hmm. Hit a button, nothing. Pray harder! <laughs> nothing, 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 nothing. Give him offerings. Do you yes. want me to call maintenance? <laughs> yes, please call maintenance. <laughs> so, uh, yeah, we, yeah, we were able to assess pretty quickly, like, all right, it's the starter, no surprise here. So I go get a hotel for a couple days, I get myself a rental car. So I'm going to be stuck in Casper, I'm going to go see Casper. Mm -hmm. What's in Casper? Independence Rock. That was pretty great, so if you nerd out about the Oregon Trail, this is a fantastic place to go see. It's about midpoint of the Oregon Trail, and there's still signatures from people who signed in either axle grease or carved it from the Oregon Trail. So that's that, cool. I don't know, make a trip to Casper. It was a lot of fun. Mm -hmm. uh, lots of good hiking, saw a waterfall. Um, so this is, that's Casper out there, the town of Casper. So I'm up on the mountains. Also, there was a MiG-15 in the hangar, and so maintenance let me hang out in the MiG-15. So. Oh, if I can't be at Oshkosh, I'm going to have my own little person on <laughs> <laughs> Was it a single place or two? Uh, two? Polish single place. Or no, this was a, a two place. Right. Two yeah. place. So stuck there for two nights. I got a nice hotel. So I'm sitting there in my hot tub, 
looking at the radar over Oshkosh, thinking, well, I would rather be at Oshkosh, <laughs> but this isn't bad either. <laughs> <laughs> so we get it all fixed up. We get the starter overnighted, and you know, it's not a difficult job, and they got it done. They let me help, so that was nice. And then I took off out of Casper. Um, looking at the weather, my initial assessment was, okay, this isn't bad. Because what I'm mostly queuing off of, is this going to be VFR? Is this going to be really strong winds? Like, all right, yeah, very VFR. It's smoky, but yeah, VFR. Um, winds, okay. Not a ton of wind, maybe 20 knots. It's not bad. You can cope with 20 knots. But what I didn't anticipate was having trouble with the heat dome. Remember hearing about the heat dome in the news a few weeks ago? So. Thinking about the temperature, when I'm planning for a flight, I think about, okay, density altitude. Do I have enough runway? And think about, okay, do I need to be gentle on my engine to not have my oil temperature spike? I don't really think about it beyond that. Well, until now, I am thinking about it from here on out. Uh, so I didn't think of it as a particularly risky flight. And overall, it still probably wasn't, but I did run into some surprising issues. So, okay. We have the smoke, which is a little bit of a visibility issue. You know, it's still a bar, but you know, it's more work to try and navigate. Uh, turbulence, okay, we can cope with turbulence, fine turbulence, but it's more work. Um, there was mountain wave, so the wind coming off of the Rockies, right, you get this nice mountain wave. It's not gonna dump you over, but it does mean you're gonna fight for altitude if you really want one particular altitude. So you can, it can shoot you up a thousand feet, bring you back down a thousand feet, and just keep oscillating like that. So it's just more work on its own, not bad. OAT was the real killer. Heat dome. It's one of the new weather phenomena to me, one of the two, the heat dome. So when I got to, when I was, I decided I was going to climb to altitude to try and stay cool. So, um, you know, 11.5 would be great. I'd settle for 9.5. But as I was crossing eh, about 7,000 feet, I'm like, all right, the turbulence started to hit pretty hard. Uh, Tiger's fine in turbulence. It has a tendency to roll a bit, so it's a little bit of work, but you know, no, nothing too bad on its own. Problem was, the higher I got, the more I lost the horizon because of the smoke. So, like, all right, I can keep it up, right? But that takes more of my attention, you know, that's more effort. Um, and the mountain wave, again, fine on its own, just takes more effort. So now we have a lot of things that just require effort. Uh, so I decide, okay, after hanging out for about half an hour, like, yeah, this is a lot of effort, I'm not gonna keep doing this. I'm gonna come down a bit. Uh, one thing I will say, though, at altitude, at about 9,500 feet, so for those of you who, smart, who uh, fly little uh, gas-powered airplanes, you've got your performance charts, right? So you can figure out, based on your conditions, how much fuel you're burning. And those charts are based on, okay, well, what's your RPM setting? What's your pressure altitude? And then there's columns for what's the outside air temperature. So that you can interpolate and, and figure out where you're at. Well, you have, in the middle of that chart, your standard day temperature. And then it has you know, not quite worst case, but pretty close to worst case, cold and hot. I was 50 degrees Fahrenheit past the hot worst case in the charts. Oh, boy. <clears throat> so, like, all right, that means even less fuel, so it's not gonna, you know, the conservatism is, is still there. I'm not gonna be burning more fuel than I think. But that's how outlandish the temperature was. That's how far off the chart we were for this at 9.5. So I decided to come down. Um, I get to about 5,000 feet it takes that to get out of the mountain wave and get out of the turbulence and have a better visibility. But now it's 38 degrees Celsius outside. Mm. So that's almost 100 degrees. Um, so I do that for a little while. I'm like, okay. Of course, there's no air conditioning in these little airplanes. You can't do that. They're heavy. Um, so I'm just sitting there baking because like, I have 38 degrees C air to cool me. <laughs> Not very cooling. Uh, so I do that for a little bit. I'm still feeling okay. But then the turbulence kicks up again. All right, well, this is, we're back to similar where we are. I'm, I'm working a lot, now I'm warm. I'm gonna try going lower to see if I can accept being warmer and less workload. Well, that didn't work out really well. Um, the highest OAT I saw was 41 degrees Celsius. So Whoa. that's 106 degrees Fahrenheit. That's too much. Wow. Yeah. So I decide, okay, this, just the temperature alone is not safe for me to exist in. Like, I, I will start to get sick. I need to get on the ground. Problem is, I'm now middle of nowhere, uh, eastern Wyoming, South Dakota, and there's not a lot of options. So, um, you know, I'm thinking, okay, I need an FBO with air conditioning. I'll just hang out for a couple hours, wait for it to cool off, you know, reset my myself, feel a little bit more comfortable. Well, the first place I landed, Pine Ridge, South Dakota, 
Um, we're about <coughs> 2 in the afternoon. It's 103 Fahrenheit and 25 knots on the ground, and there was no FBO. Oh, whoa. So there's no shelter. Now, I know the mentality is generally, it's always better to be on the ground than it is being in the air. Nobody's ever plummeted to their death from the ground. Well, if I'm just hanging out 100 degrees, uh, 103 uh, Fahrenheit, 25 knots, no shelter, you know, I check the weather <laughs> forecast, it's only 2 p.m. It's going to stay those conditions for at least right. another three hours. Mm -hmm. I can't stay in that. I will get sick. I might hurt myself. I might end up in the hospital. So there's an airport 15 miles southeast. I don't know what's there. All I know is I can't stay here. So I pop on over. Um, eh, what size? This slide too early. So I pop on over um, to, uh, to this other airport, and um, there's at least an FBO. No air conditioning, though. Nobody around. Like, okay. But there are rolls of paper towels, there's running water, and so I, I'm glad I didn't take any photos of this. But so I'm hanging out in the FBO. I've got a whole pile of paper towels just soaked with water, like on my forehead, on my neck, on my arms, on my legs, and I just stay there for two and a half hours. Like, okay, this is better than being in the airplane now, at least. Wow. Um, so eventually I did cool down, like, all right, you know, I, I, I could feel as soon as I stopped feeling sick, all right, we're good to fly again. And so I made it to Spencer, Iowa. Um, I'm always nervous doing cross-country flights in the Midwest where there's a lot of hum humidity. Um, I'm really keyed up on watching the temperature dew point spread mm -hmm. because as soon as they hit zero, it could just completely sock in everywhere simultaneously. Right? So it's not like a front moving in, not like clouds moving in where I can move around it and pick around it. No, everything just socks it. Sometimes, sometimes it doesn't. I don't know how to tell the difference of when it'll be okay versus when it'll not be okay. So in general, when I see the temp dew point spread closing in that area of the country, I just land. Um, so and at night, we had a concentrated set of storms here. So you've got the colors on floor, floor flight. The yellow is convective prediction. So a storm could pop up anywhere in that yellow. And then the red is that there's storms right here, right now. So like, OK, I'm heading towards storms. Storms are between me and Oshkosh. I'm just going to go ahead and land. Um, so I wind up camping out on the ramp. I sleep in the back of the airplane. Mm. This me heating up my super mobile camp stove. <laughs> it's not comfortable, but it works. I was in striking distance of Oshkosh. I didn't go to Oshkosh. This is Tuesday. Because of the next weather event that was predicted. They were predicting um, a very strong windstorm and hail. I'm like, eh, all right. I get all the way to Maston, New Lisbon. Oshkosh is 40 nautical miles away. I'm like, ah, oh, it's not worth it to fight my way in there just to try and escape some, uh, some hail. Um, so I'm like, all right, well, I'm going to play with the airplane a little bit. Um, so I, <coughs> lay, I did touch and goes at two really gorgeous grass strips. Then I decided to fly along the Mississippi real low and just see the Mississippi. And then ended up at Prairie du Chien. Uh, I had called around ahead of time to see if there was a hangar where I could put my plane to escape the storms because the storms were predicted to start up in the Great Lakes and just push their way on to include Prairie du Chien. There were no hangars available and at least I was in an open airport with that debris so if the winds do kick up it's just subject to my plane being rattled around and not being hit by other stuff in other airplanes so I figured that would be better. So I got a burger out of here and had a fine time. <coughs> And this is what the flying looked like. So that's at a uh, Spencer. Woke up really early to see the ag planes all start and go. That was fun. Um, so that's the Mississippi. So it was you know a gray, hazy day, which is still really beautiful. Um, absolutely gorgeous to see the like the little licks of clouds through the trees. Really pretty. This is what was on the EAA's Facebook page, predicting a derecho event. I had never heard of a derecho event before. Right? Yeah, so I'm seeing some, some shocked faces. It's a, a windstorm associated with persistent thunderstorms, according <coughs> to Wikipedia. So this is the derecho event. So you can see some vorticity, potentially tornadoes. There were tornadoes. Fortunately, the hail and tornadoes did not hit Oshkosh. Uh, I talked to some people once I got there. They were, they were fully prepared for it. Um, there was some P51 guys, so what they did was prior to the event, they went into town to the local carpet store bought a bunch of carpeting and saran wrapped it around their airplane so at least the hail would bounce off without affecting oh, the airplane. Oh yeah. my gosh. Yeah. So even though tornadoes and hail didn't hit, I was still really happy to not be there because they did get washed out, of course. Okay, so it's been a bit of a fight trying to get as far as I have at this point. But we still have getting into Oshkosh itself. <laughs> Flying into Oshkosh is kind of no joke. The notum, if you print it off, 
is 36 pages. Come on in, have a seat. Thank you. Yeah, so the notum is huge. That's a lot of information <coughs> to try and retain. Um, so this is an overview of, uh, of getting into Oshkosh itself. So I'm starting from Prairie du Chien, and this is the first uh, possible transition. So your transition is Endeavor Bridge, Puckaway Lake, Green Lake, Ripon, Fisk, and then the airport. So it's a really short stretch where all of the aircraft are converging trying to get in. Now this is middle of the week, so I'm hoping, okay, it's not going to be as bad as like the weekend before, right? We're, we're talking Wednesday morning at this point. So when that depicts all the notes that I used to get in, I wanted it reduced to one page so that I'm not flipping through as I'm flying and trying to spot traffic, right? Because I, I need to be looking for traffic. So even if I had ADS-B in to show traffic, well, not everybody has ADS-B. You still need to be heads out looking around, right? It's a VFR um, uh, arrival. So 36 pages, okay, now I need to pick... I can't just arrive any time during the day. It's going to be a particular windows. All right, it's not that bad, but you know, it's just one more thing. Um, there could be four different waypoints um, depending on you know how much traffic there is. Do I show up at this point or in the middle? Eh, I just plan to just all right. Well, let's just plan for Endeavor Bridge, and I'll just be configured at Endeavor Bridge and work my way. Um, and then there's three potential holds depending upon where you are in all of this. So you got to have that memorized or available for very quick reference if they call you know holding. Um, five possible runways and the go-arounds, most of them aren't just go straight because now you have high traffic in other areas and so you can't be here if you're on this way. And so it, it's just this whole thing. <laughs> and even in an alternate field, Fond du Lac, um, if you're just looking at your VFR chart, it shows on the tower. Guess what? It has a tower for Oshkosh. So even if you bug out, you needed to have read this ahead of time to know that, no, they have a frequency, this is their frequency. you got to talk to them before getting in. Um, you make no radio calls, so it's just weird. Right? You think, oh, that's less work, you don't have to make radio calls. No, but it's, it's different. Anything different is just going to be harder with all of this. It's really surreal to do it. Um, you, you don't land on just the threshold, ooh, I'm going to land and have a whole rollout. No, they call out a colored spot. So yeah. the runways have between two and four different spots that you have to land on. So you've got to hit your spot. Don't land early, don't land late. Hit your spot. And it saturates the traffic such that ATC, for the duration of Oshkosh, will not offer flight following services within a 70 nautical mile radius of Oshkosh. Wow. <laughs> so there's a lot going on here. There's a lot to consider. And I made it. It worked just fine. <laughs> I say just fine, like they had one of the handoffs, Tower didn't get the handoff that I was there, so I'm on base and I did make a radio call saying, hey, did you want me to do anything here? And I got yelled at, you need to go to Fisk. Look, I just came from Fisk. They hit me off. Ah. All right, clear to land, red square, three, six, right. So they let me in anyway. It worked out, though. It was just fine. Yeah. So I've got an anecdote with every single one of these. I got to see some really cool aircraft, did the Bell 47 ride, which you can just pay 55 bucks and go do it. Originally, I wasn't going to because it's kind of difficult to get to the Pitt Heron Airport. But I won a little raffle, so like, oh, well, all right, if it's for free, now I have to. It was completely worth it. I saw this airplane, which just looks ridiculous. It's in the museum. It's in Aronka K. Um, this one I want to tell you about, just because I am so enamored that I found out. Um, one, there is a company in Texas called Kip Aero who manufactures kit-build, full-scale World War I replica aircraft. Hmm. So if you want to build and fly a sock with a camel or a Fokker triclane, you can do that. And even cooler is that there's a guy in New Zealand making new manufactured gnome rotary engines. Not radial, rotary. <coughs> Go for it. Um, the rotary engine, right, it looks like a radial, except all of it turns. So the propeller is bolted to the engine and the whole engine spins. Oh. <laughs> so you can just go buy one of those now. <laughs> new manufacturer. <laughs> So, of course, I spend most of my time in Warbirds. That's what I really love, so I went and hung out in the Warbirds. That's me standing on top of the PUI Catalina. We'll get back to that. And just, there was so much nutty stuff. Like, I can't possibly show you all of the photos to, you know, fully encompass what this was. That's the, um, the sweepstakes Grum and Tiger at AOP. AOPA is, is raffling off that you can win. It's me camping on the grass, just enjoying. I talked my way into a P-51. Did you get to sit in the deck? No, that's one of the ones that's permanently on display there, so there wasn't anybody there no, with it. If somebody had personally flown it in, I would have tried. Yes. 
but I'll accept the PBY. So the, this particular PBY, affectionately known as Turtle, um, was on an adventure I went on about a year ago. And so I knew these guys. Um, so one of my friends, uh, Peter, was like, hey, we should surprise the owner of the PBY, follow me, right? So, you know, we go into the plane, we crawl up through the canopy, you can just pop the windows open, you hop up on top of the aircraft, and then to get on the wing, there's actually a step in that pylon and some handles, and so you can step and haul your way on up. And the front half of the wing is very robust, is metal, and the back half is fabric, so just don't stand on the fabric, right? So, you see these two little, little bubbles here? Right, so that's in the aft part of the fuselage. <coughs> the owner, John, was hanging out there. And so I hop up on the wing and pop on out. Hey, John! And so that photo was taken by John as he's screaming at me to get off his airplane. <laughs> you can see how angry he was that he pulled out his phone and was taking photos. And then he sent it to me for this presentation. So that's the only photo in this I didn't take. It was taken by John. So that's me up in the top corner, and that's Peter with a giant grin because he had such a great idea to harass John. Oshkosh was only part of the story, right? That was my primary goal. Um, so, you know, initially leaving Oshkosh, I was like, oh, I have all these emotions, I'm so sad, this was magical, I get to see so many friends, oh, there's so much aviation. Yeah, well, you know, if I could have told myself, like, eh, don't worry, you're just going to stumble into more of it in a few days anyway. Uh, so, I worked my way over to, bonus points, anybody who can pronounce this? <laughs> well done, we have a room full of very educated people. I don't know why you know that, and I'm not following up the <laughs> So Schenectady, New York, um, which is adjacent to Albany. Albany International is actually close to my parents. Was like, eh, it's a class Charlie. I've just been through like a lot. Like now, we're, we're going to go land at, at Schenectady. That's much easier to deal with. But yeah, like again, another fantastic flight. Like oh, I saw the Chicago skyline from 10,000 feet. Like I did stop at Akron overnight, but um, yeah, still still hazy. But um, that was one of my fuel stops. That's at Akron. I haven't had time to follow up on what's going on here, but it looks like a Zeppelin hangar, and I want to know more. Mm -hmm. uh, yeah, like, oh, danced over the clouds at 12,000 feet, felt like an angel. It's just like, this is just what this whole trip was. Again, another footnote of something that's a completely spectacular life experience here. Um, and then landed at Schenectady. I included this little guy because it just cracked me up to see somebody who owns a Cherokee painted it like a Southwest 737. <laughs> <laughs> and you can't tell in the photo. So usually it says Southwest up here. It says Tim West. Uh, Somebody named uh, Tim did that to a Cherokee, and I love it. People take their paint entirely too seriously. I like I hope so. All right, here's a, here's a zoomed-in view of the trouble I got into, right? So I get disconnected. I'm really there to visit my parents. So I'm not spending every day flying. Now I'm hanging out with my parents, and that was wonderful to see them. It was a really great visit. Um, it was so great to share a little bit of aviation with them while I was there, because they've seen my tiger before, but only a couple of times. So that was really great. Um, this is a zoomed in view of kind of what's going on here. But my friend in Frederick, right, said I was going to go see my college friend. That was wonderful. This airspace is insane and I don't like it. Uh, what popped up to Boston, because another friend of mine was like, yeah, you should come and have lunch since you're on the side of the country and we haven't seen each other in five years. Well, all right, let's go to lunch. Uh, so it, it, was, it was just a lot of fun to pop around and do this. So here's a few photos, right? So we have the Potomac, cooler with that, saw Hudson River, or sorry, yeah, Potomac, Hudson. Uh, Catskill Mountains, this is what passes for mountains on the East Coast. <laughs> they are really beautiful, but it's a lot less imposing than, you know, <coughs> right? Um, so I only stayed at Schenectady one evening. It's again, from that adventure from a year ago, uh, David Prescott, who was on that adventure as well, and Andres, two really dear friends of mine, and they messaged me ahead of time, like, hey, so you're coming to Albany, you're gonna come say hi, right? I'm like, well, all right, how bad is it flying Albany International? It's like, nothing, there's four flights a day, just come on over. And yeah, it was nothing, so it was another thing I built up in my head as a whole big deal, and now it's fine. Yeah. So I flew into Albany, and I uh, was able to park in David's hangar. So that's a T6, and that's a T6. That's me in the back of a T6. Nice. <laughs> so when I got to Albany, um, so David said, hey, do you want to ride one of the T6? I'm like, yes, I do. He actually said, would you rather have a ride in the Cirrus or the T6? I'm like, well, <laughs> <laughs> right? right? Like, come on now. <laughs> I don't think Kathy would have invited me to speak if I had picked the Cirrus. Oh, oh Cirrus. Right, Cirrus. Oh. <laughs> Here's the second maintenance issue. <laughs> we went for a lovely ride in the T6, and when David landed, 
Um, when he set the tail, you know, it was a very nice soft landing when he gently set the tail wheel down. Oh. It felt like there was a bit of commotion back there, but I don't know. I don't know T6s, like maybe that's normal. Maybe it just bounced a little bit. No, nope, tail wheel was completely flat. So on rollout, I noticed the airplane is sitting kind of like this. I'm like, hey David, did you lose pressure in strut? What's going on here? It's like, yeah, this is a little unusual. You want me to hop out and check? I don't mind. I'm like, no, it still feels like it's rolling pretty good. And then we get to the hangar and we see that. So, so uh, no airplane is ever completely happy. <laughs> They're not. They're not. They're never happy. Yeah. So this is David's other hangar. So these are two Collings Foundation aircraft. So the Sky Raider and the Corsair. I had no idea Sky Raiders were this big. I'd never seen one in person before. Massive. And this one was modified to perform an AWACS mission. So there's actually a bunch of seating back here, too. So it's not just this that's open. So you have two pilots and then more crew behind them. So this is a very special Sky Raider. And there's this thing up here, I love to bits. So um, David's wife won't let him fly it anymore because it's a tiny home-built <laughs> Corsair replica. It's super little. It's got an O200 in the front. And it just looks like it's a total riot. I, I've seen the midget Mustangs before. I've never seen, you know, a little bitty Corsair before. And he said he could get 200 miles out of it, 200 miles an hour out of it. So I bet that thing's a riot. I look who I found again in Frederick, Maryland. It's the AOPA sweepstakes tiger. Nice. <laughs> Small world. And then MU2, they're goofy. I just I get excited anytime I see MU2. And then this was the predecessor to the Katmai modification 182. It's really goofy. It's throw canard on 182. And a bunch of devices on the way. Why not? Works really well. <laughs> Pretty neat to read about. Yeah. Oh yeah, with that bottom photo too. That was really great. So when David said, "Hey, you should come visit," I said, "Only if I can, you know, show my parents your hangar." And so yeah, it was so fun to see my dad. Like he saw the Corsair and just like lit up and just just zombie walked over to it. It's such a cool airplane to behold. So it was really yes. fun to share with my parents. And then it got crazier. <laughs> So um, after I got that ride from David and his T6, uh, Deja Vu, there's Tora, Deja Vu, Tora is painted up like a zero. Deja Vu is actually a South African modded um, T6, so a bit more modern, huge instrument panels, but it has a post-war paint that looks really good. So that's, that's Deja Vu right there with Felix the cat on the nose. <laughs> um, so after I got the ride, they would ask me, hey, you know, one of the women who works for the catering company, she's got two young daughters, would you mind taking them for a flight in the tiger? I'm like, oh, of course, absolutely. So that was really fun. They had a good time. Um, and then uh, David texted me about a day later, like, how much longer are you in town? I'm like, oh, I'm going to leave in a couple days. Like, well, if you stick around until Monday, I've got a T6 instructor friend of mine coming into town, and if you want, you guys can borrow Deja Vu for a lesson. Am I going to say no to a 900 horsepower T6 lesson? No, of course not. Like, I love you, NASA, but it's going to be a few more days. <laughs> so I hung out, um, got a lesson. It was great fun. Oh, my gosh. So I got to do um, the taxi, the takeoff, the landing. We tried to work it such that I could see the runway, but we didn't have enough time to brief up of whether or not I can put it into a full slip and kick it out at the end. Um, but it, like I said, with that South African mod instrument panel, it's way higher. And so we were real far nose down. I'm like, I'm sorry, Matt. I can't. I can't see the one way at all. It's like, ah, all right. We'll go teach you to do some aileron rolls instead. So we did some of that. Um, and then after the lesson, Matt was like, Hey, you know what kind of timeline you're on? I'm like, I'm just here for this. So we popped over to a nearby graph strip, Murphy Strip, uh, for a picnic, where there were yeah they were holding a big picnic, and there were two more T6s and Myers biplane and a whole slew of other crazy things. Um, so for the picnic, since we had three T6s there, like, whoa, we've got to do some formation flying. Of course. I was dead weight for it, but my goodness, it was a lot of fun. So absolutely incredible. I've got a video that I put together of all the footage at the end of it, if anybody's interested and wants to see it. Uh, yeah, there was also a Mustang, because, you know, why not? It's just when you run around, find grass strips, you find Mustangs, T34. Bonanza. But it's a jet bonanza. It's got a Rolls Royce engine in it. Mm, I'd never nice. seen one of those before. I didn't know that was a thing. Isn't that cool? Yeah, it's a beautiful grass strip and like a dork. I wear my little leather helmet because right, <laughs> I'm, I'm riding around in a T6. I'm putting my helmet on. <laughs> <laughs> and it was at this point in the trip, I get an email from Kathy saying, Hey, when you come back, you want to speak about your trip? I'm like, Kathy, don't jinx me. Like, uh, I've only done half of the flying. Like, no, I'm not. <laughs> Like, come on now, let's wait to talk about this. And she's like, oh no, it's like a horse coming back to the barn, you're gonna have no problems. And I didn't. It was fine. This was another 20 hours of flying, and it was uh, much smoother than the rest. Spread over three days, 
because I got, you know, to the corner of West Virginia, hit storms. I'm like, all right, Atlanta waited out. Kept going, got to about here, hit storms. Had to wait it out, but no, yeah, it wasn't bad at all. And then from Albuquerque, I'm back to Moravia. Oh, and of course, yeah, it was, it was spread over three days, and of course it was a lot of fun, but compared to all the rest of it, you know, fairly mundane, right? Um, so that South Albany is a huge rail yard there. There's a bunch of cool stuff at South Albany. Albany International has expensive gas, South Albany does not, so I just pop over and, you know, you know, save what money I can. Coming out of Texas, my phone started overheating, so I reached for my iPad, opened it up, it immediately gave me the same message. <laughs> All right, well, at least I have flight following. I'll just ask for vectors back <laughs> if these both die on me. Fortunately, neither of them fully shut off. Um, but uh, it's crossing the Mississippi again. Who knows what Southern Airways uh, Flight 932 is known for? <coughs> Quick quiz. All right, I only see eyebrows. Who's seen the movie We Are Marshall? Yeah. Oh, yeah. Yes. So the Tri-State Airport, um, when the DC-9 and we, we Are Marshall was on, our, uh, it was, it was on short approach, um, they landed short, hit, uh, hit the hillsides, and uh, read the reports. It sounded like there wasn't anything particularly definitive, but the leading theory is that um, it is that they got distracted by an oil refinery. It's huge. That's the oil refinery. I could see how that would be distracting in IFR conditions, but yeah, it killed the, uh, the, uh, most of the Marshall football team, and so that's why it's it's uh, yeah, it, it's noteworthy. Yeah, very sad story, but. So it's, it's really interesting flying around the country and then what do the locals tell you about their local airport. And so that was, you know, I got an Uber ride and that was, hey, did you know? And I'm like, yes, I did know. I didn't connect that it was here though. So, you know, so I got that story out of him. So that was uh, over Albuquerque and then just watching, there's nothing like watching the country slowly transition from like East Coast Catskills mm -hmm. to Desert and Mojave. It's so neat to see, to see that gradient go by. I made it home. Yay. Yay. <laughs> what was that? Gas prices. Well, great. So with uh, with avgas, it's highly variable. So it's, you know, with, with auto gas, it's more about what state am I in. With <coughs> avgas, right, it's like, well, you know, am I at a big airport or a little airport? Um, so on four flight, you can pull up 100 low lead prices and you can see and you can pick, ah, that's the lowest. The lowest in wherever you want to be invariably is notum out of fuel. Always check your notums. That happened to me about three times in Ed Fort, and I caught it every time because I checked my notums before each flight. They nope, can't go there, can't go there. Um, so I paid anywhere from uh, what 350 a gallon to uh, uh, maybe about 520 a gallon. Yeah. So there were some times when I landed, didn't necessarily intend to. I'm like, all right, um, it's not easy to tell how much fuel is in the tiger's wings. Right, so if you look in, um, they're, they're angled, so you can have up to like seven gallons of gas and it can look empty. Mm -hmm. Seven gallons of gas in a 10 gallon an hour airplane is actually a lot, especially if you could have 14 and it totally looks empty, it's really easy to fall into that trap. Oh, I probably have fuel. Oh, I probably have fuel. <laughs> so I am determined not to do that. So even if I am at a place that's like, all right, the gas is expensive, we're at least going to put in enough so that I can see it and be confident of how much I have. Or like you. Yeah, so you know, happy to stick around and chit chat about you know other anecdotes. I'll probably just play the the videos in the background for anybody who wants to check those out. I've got the Bell 47 ride. I've got um, uh, the T6 formation flight um, there, and then uh, a little video of uh, going by a really really beautiful little grass strip. I've been to this. Yeah. 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 I used to work out. But yeah, thank you so much everybody for attending. I really appreciate it. Give me a chance to tell the story.